Sarah McKenzie, author of this beautiful brand new book. It is called The Complete Guide to the Enneagram, a modern approach to self-discovery and connecting well with others. Sierra, thank you so much for joining us on Undistracted. I really appreciate your time today. Laura, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be talking to you about this. The Enneagram is something that's really near and dear to my heart, and I can't believe the book is out now. Wow. Yeah, con- congratulations. It's nice to you know have something physical, something tangible that really sums up so much of what has been an interest for you for a lot of years. Some mm. of our listeners will be familiar with the Enneagram type, looking at our personality through the lens of these nine different uh, archetypes, I suppose you could call it. When did your interest in Enneagram begin? How did you come across it? Well, you would laugh because I actually touched on this a little bit in the book, but I was 14 or 15 years old and someone said, hey, you're such a four. And I said, what does that mean? Why are you telling me I'm a certain type? And it actually forced me to, it didn't force me to, I made the choice to ignore the Enneagram for many, many years because of that. So it came back to me again, probably when I was in my early 20s, late teens, um, which was several years ago. And it became a point of contention a little bit where I thought, I need to get more into this. And I, I have a background in psychology. My mom loves psychology. Um, and so I kind of went through that again, went through the phases, read through books and realized, oh my goodness, like this actually explains me so much more than anything else. And not necessarily to the point where it became my identity. Um, but I was talking about it all the time and starting to get really into it with people. And I think that one thing that really stuck out to me about this and it made me cry was that, um, it, the Enneagram takes the mask off of you. Um, So it not only tells you things about yourself, it also tells you the bad things about yourself. You know how you can jump on something where it says, these are the good things about yourself and these are the points of strength and things like that. Like I love those kind of things, but I also have been one of those kids since I was little. I wanna know what I can do better. Mm -hmm. Um, And so the Enneagram for me, that was the hooking point for me was that it explained me but it also explained what I needed to do um, in order to be a better version of myself and be a healthy version of myself. So that's that. Yeah. Mm. It's interesting to think that all of us in some way, I'm sure, need to feel like we have a grip on who we are. We want to understand what makes us tick and what can help us move forward in life. What do you think motivated that for you? Why are you someone who wants to just, like you say, take the mask off who you are as a person? I think for me personally, so my number that I identify with is a nine, um, which is the peacemaker, but I wing eight and I'm sure we'll discuss that shortly. But for some, for most of my life, I'd always felt this antithesis. The the nine is the peacemaker and the eight is the challenger. And so for me, I constantly felt like I was at war with myself. Do I want to keep the peace? Do I want to make everybody happy, which is the core motivation of the nine or I have this massive justice streak and stubborn streak. And how do I combine both of those in in real life? And so I think in thinking about that, how they both just came together for me and how they work together was something that really motivated me. I thought, oh my goodness, there are actually people in the world who understand how my brain works and why I'm constantly at a struggle um, and standstill at times with, do I, do I just shut up and make everybody happy? Um, or do I actually speak out about these important things and why do I get angry? And when I don't feel angry and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't necessarily a matter of, I want to know more about myself. It was more a matter of, Oh, how do I, how do I cope with this? Um, and obviously I had done that journey with my mom as well. And it was never a psychological thing, but it was more of a, Oh, this is actually a great learning tool. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was, that was it for me. I just wanted to learn how do I make both sides of my brain cope and comprehend Mm -hmm. what I was doing and why I was doing it. And it's one thing to suddenly go, oh my goodness, this is why I do things this way. Or, oh, I really do relate to these certain personality types. I know for me, I'm a three, which is said to be the achiever, someone who is really motivated by what am I doing? How am I making progress? And how is that seen? Which Mm -hmm. can have really unhealthy traits, of course, because you don't want to be totally validated by, you know, ticking boxes, but it does make you go, oh, no wonder I feel really validated when someone acknowledges effort I've put in somewhere, or Mm -hmm. someone can see how much it means to me to receive feedback about the work or contribution that I make. Knowing those things though is lovely, but how does it actually help us, do you think, go about our days what kind of influence does it have on the way you know we approach our work approach our our uh, friendships our love life etc right well i think when we're talking about the daily life when what the enneagram does is it works to help you find your 
your passion and your purpose in life as you will. You mentioned you're a three. I love that. Most of my good friends growing up were threes um, and sevens. And I think just because they help pull me out of my comfort zone. Um, but basically what the Enneagram does in day to day is it helps you become aware of the old unhelpful habits that no longer work for you or serve you. Um, and they're the ones that you live out unconsciously. So when I wake up in the morning, my initial reaction is maybe not to go for a run or not to go do something that's healthy for me. It's, it's more of a, okay, I'm going to sit and have a cup of coffee in the morning and have my quiet time and um, have a think about life. But the reality is, is I know that if I want to get up and get my day rolling the way that I should, I can tap into my eight wing or I can tap into my three, which I am connected to as well, and utilize those to help my good habits along. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that I don't enjoy those quiet mornings. It just means that I know if I want to do X, Y, Z and prioritize those things in my life, then I know mm -hmm. how to step away from maybe something that isn't a bad habit, but isn't necessarily fulfilling my long term. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it does. And I feel like as well, the beauty of the Enneagram and I mean, there's many different personality types that uh, to personality type tests that people can do. But I feel like one of the things I really like about this sort of thing is that in those moments where, you know, maybe you're pushing yourself to get out of bed and you're just not into it, or maybe you're feeling like you're just a little bit muddled in your day. I feel like you suddenly get a bit of an answer as to why that is. Like if a conversation, for instance, a moment of conflict is making you feel particularly uncomfortable, mm -hmm. something like this makes you go, oh, that's because I actually feel like conflict is difficult or I feel like I need to be heard like this or be able to speak up like this in conflict. And so it gives you like a an answer as to why some parts in your day unfold the way they do. Exactly. And I think, as you said, when you're talking about the way you think about things, it automatically gives you a lot more empathy for the way other people think about things as well. So I think what's so important about studying your type, but also the entire nine types as a whole, is you said you're a three. I don't immediately think I have you figured out, but I also understand a little bit more about why you are the way you are, why you think the way you think. You know what I mean? Mm. So I can empathize with somebody who's maybe a little bit harsher or different in the way they communicate than the way I would like to be communicated with. And I can say, you know what? I am not the only person in this conversation and step away from that and recognize, okay, these are, this is why they're communicating the way they are. And as I said, it, it opens the, the pathways of communication a lot more. You're able to understand somebody a lot more easily. And I think, um, even as individuals and as tr Christians, like we're able to, build the kingdom a little bit more easily that way um, because we're not focusing from a point of, oh, this is how I feel and this is how I, I want to think. It's mm. I have something to say that's important. You have something to say that's equally important. How do we communicate it best so that both pieces fit together? Um, yeah. And personal responsibility is going to be the big thing here because, of course, we don't all walk around with labels on our shoulders of, you know, I'm a three, I'm a two, I'm a nine, whatever. Like you, you go <laughs> in, you're going into the world having no clue what the majority of people around you might be, but you know what you are. So you have to, it becomes a little bit about self-reflection, self-responsibility to know how to take what you're receiving in life and respond to it in a healthy way based on your understanding of how you perceive the world and what things might be uh, tension or um, sort of uh, trigger points for you. Yes. And I think it's important that we make sure we don't go around typing people in our lives mm. um, because not only does that put them in a box, it might create the same experience that I experienced when I was a young teenager where I said, I don't want to be put in the box and kind of put me off that a little bit. Um, but it also, I think really, it discredits the person a little bit because you're saying that you know everything about them when the reality is all of us relate to all of the nine motivations. It's just a matter of what order they relate to you the best. So for example, I love, I, I work really well with threes and fours and sevens because those are all things that are really important to me. Those motivations are, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're the most important motivation to me. Um, so yeah, I think, as you said, self-responsibility, self-reflection is a lot, um, to do with it. But I think that also the way that we respond to other people is, is really based on how healthy we are as well. So. Mm, it, it's huge. There's so much in this. And you did mention a couple of moments ago, this idea of the wings, that you're not just a nine, you wing an eight, as you put it. Talk to us a little bit about that concept, because like you say, none of us want to be put into a box. I'm sure there is a certain type that is very much <laughs> against being put into a box, but what does it mean to wing a certain way? 
Definitely. Um, so when we think about the Enneagram, I know a lot of people think, oh, I just only have these nine types and how could we fit into that? But there's actually the two wings on either side. So if you look at the diagram, you've got the one through nine on there. The wings are the two numbers on either side. So there's actually a theory among a few theologians that you use both wings um, pretty consistently the healthier you are. But um, you do generally, traditionally speaking, you have a more dominant wing. So for example, if you're a one and you sit on the one on the Enneagram, you have a wing nine and a wing two. Um, you will have a dominant wing, but um, you have the opportunity to use both of those at certain times. So you aren't really stagnant in the way or static in the way that you use them. You could wing nine more frequently, or you could use two, step into two a little bit more often. Um, and when you're stepping into both of those, you actually uncover another layer of personality because you're not just a one, you're a one wing two, for mm. example. Um, and that's going to really affect your framework. You're not seeing things only as a one who tends to be a little bit more perfectionistic. You're going to see things as a one who's perfectionistic, but with a very strong helper wing. So they're going to work together in that sense. And it's going to be different. Yeah, and I want to just mention quickly, I'll run through exactly what the, the nine are called for people who might just be curious what each number represents, okay? So you've got a one that is the reformer, a two, the helper, three, the achiever, four, the individualist, five, the investigator, six, the loyalist, seven, the enthusiast, eight, the challenger, and nine is the peacemaker. So while we're not going to have time in this conversation to drill down into what, what each of those exactly involve, they are reflecting very distinct uh, drivers of personalities, people that do, as you've mentioned, want to challenge stuff, people that want to bring peace, people that are motivated to achieve and so many different kinds of traits. So it's it's a broad system, I suppose, is what I'm getting at. It's not something that's super narrow. But as we've spoken about, it is something that can help us understand ourselves from a spiritual perspective as well. We're all created in God's, God's image, which is a shared identity, but yet we're all so, so unique. So when you look at something like this from that spiritual lens, how do you see it helping us understand ourselves in light of that identity we have under God? I think this is such a good question. When I was back in the States, I was... I had the privilege of bringing this to a couple of different churches in my area. And so what we did was we distributed the tests beforehand um, so people could take them, kind of get an idea of maybe what types they would be. Um, and there were a couple of different churches that we went to that every person who was on staff tested as a two, which is the helper. Um, and I always joke that if I write another book, it's going to be called The Holy Spirit is a Two. But, uh, <laughs> but the thing is, is that I knew a couple of these people personally, um, maybe not from being in the same church, but just having friendships outside of, of that. And they were not twos. They were testing through the lens of this is what I should be doing because I'm on staff. Mm. And so I think that when we approach the Enneagram spiritually and think about it as an identity before God, we want to be our most authentic selves before him um, and in front of other people as well. But when we think about authenticity and originality, I think that um, it's very important that we that we make sure that we're just as authentic towards God because he already sees that any anyway, you know. Um, and so when we look at the Enneagram from a spiritual perspective, how we relate to others and treat them as children of God just as much um, as expecting to be treated as children of God really opens our eyes to the way we each function. Um, and I think as we, as we bring this into our lives more consistently as an identity thing, not necessarily like this is who I am, but it takes you into the realm of that into this is who I was created to be. Mm. So we're looking at things from a level of unhealthy to healthy. Um, and we touch on that briefly in the book. Um, but unhealthy, just don't want to go there. And it's funny because I'll have people ask me all the time, oh, what's the most jealous Enneagram number? Or what's the most um, angry Enneagram number? And I'm like, all of them are if, <laughs> mm. if you're unhealthy. So I think when we're looking at this again from a spiritual perspective, when it's all about um, how do I create my life as a living sacrifice before God as he asks us to, we want to be that authentic self. We want to be that not before him, not only before him, but in front of everybody as well. And that mm. really speaks into the the beauty of our lives as they were created to be. Right. And it, I think also it, as you're saying those sorts of things, it makes me reflect on the fact that this isn't about uh, creating limitations on our identity, but it no. is about finding ways to walk toward healing. That is the goal here. Like you, You're not trying to sell people on a way to see themselves, but uh, 
a sense of, hey, if we know the way our brains operate, if we can look at our lives from a psychological perspective that gives us insight, that actually takes us toward health, wholeness, healing, which is the goal that both in and outside of the Christian world, people have for themselves. We want to be well humans. Yes, exactly. And I think when we, when wellness is the goal and wholeness is the goal, we operate from a different path. It's like when we go to a therapy or when we go to counseling or when we go to see anybody, the goal is to be better and to be healthy and well in the way that we function and operate. So using the Enneagram in that sense, um, healing is a very, it's a very big factor. And it's something that comes out of most coaching sessions because we have the, we have the perspective of one person, you know, we, we have the opportunity to paradigm shift and think about things through others lens. And some numbers do that better than others, but we still, we're still never other people. We don't know their story. We don't know their background. We touch a bit on childhood wounds as well um, in the book and how that works through your framework and how you function. And it's like there are all these different layers to things that contribute to who you are. Um, But using the Enneagram within that sense, you're able to see where you were and where you have the possibility of getting to. And I think, Mm. honestly, I'm so promotivated personally to know where I can get better. As I mentioned before, like, how do I become that most whole version of myself? Um, And as you become the most whole version of yourself, you actually allow other people to become a vulnerable, open, whole version of themselves as well. Mm. You know, for me, when I'm a little bit more... um, put together. And I think that there's nothing wrong with being completely put together and making sure that your life fits the way it does. Just so long as you're presenting, presenting the whole package. Mm. That doesn't need to go around telling people your entire life story um, without trusting them. (laughs) But it does mean that you're able to give somebody, Hey, this is, this is me. Um, I'm not going to make excuses for myself, but also this is, this is where I've, come from and Mm. going and it allows that openness to take Mm. place and it gives people a picture of where weak points can be as as we you know do put together our lives and we seek to have that kind of I was going to say we seek to have this kind of complete sense of health that is something that evolves and changes to our life like throughout our life I don't think we ever like hey I've made it here's my happy you know (laughs) well-rounded life and I'm so healthy because things change throughout our lives and we realize things that we didn't realize before and then we've got to adjust those elements but within that journey working out where weak points are and where difficulties might lie is so important and you touched on something earlier for you someone who is both a peacemaker but then also has that challenger streak and that justice streak Mm. how how have you sought to resolve the tensions that exist between the two how do you work through the difficulties of wanting to help people please people resolve conflict, but then also push the boundaries a little bit? Well, as you said, we're learning every day. And I think that the older I get, the more I realize, oh, okay, like these are the things that are really important to me and I place value on these things. Um, So for example, as I said, the justice streak, like I want to make sure everything is fair um, and I want to make sure that everybody is well. And so I think that having the inner core motivation of making sure that everybody is happy is, is wonderful. And I have embraced that, but not at the expense of making sure that, um, not at the expense of losing myself because as a nine, I tend to merge with the opinions of others. Um, and that has been a tendency that I have worked through and gone to counseling for and, um, written a lot of, written a lot about. Um, and I think that as I've gotten older and actually recognized, okay, these are my triggers for when I'm going to get angry. Um, because eights, they just, they just get a little bit angry and mm. they tend to be an extra extroverted anger person. Um, so they let it out. They don't necessarily hold it in. Um, what happens then is that I know my trigger points and it keeps me from actually having an explosion because I'm able to say, well, actually here's maybe a different perspective on that. And I can keep it in check. Everybody is mm. still happy. The communication is stronger because I don't feel like I'm being walked over and my opinions are being heard and being valued, but it's not necessarily anybody else's fault. It was always my fault. And the way I communicated things, I always thought, oh man, this person isn't letting me speak. But the reality is I wasn't actually speaking. And I think when you approach life from the point of view that you're not a victim of it, you're never a victim of circumstance. Mm. Um, 
you're able to actually emerge a lot stronger. So there are a couple of types that actually are a little bit more of an antithesis. So like the four and the five, the four is extremely emotional. So that's the um, individualist and the five is the analyst um, or the investigator. And the individualist is beautifully emotional and, and has a bit of a moodiness to them and they're the creators. Um, but then the five is very analytical and not people oriented at all. And yeah. very task oriented and likes to have their own space. So it's funny mm. because the eight and the nine and the four and the five are very opposite. Um, so I think it's learning how to cohabit. It's almost like having two people inside of yourself. You don't, but it, mm. it's almost like having two different halves of a whole that fit together. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's been a learning journey for me, but I think I'm a lot more vocal than I was. Yeah. And it's good. It's You get, you get confidence. I think something like this gives you confidence to say, I know that it is difficult for me to speak up, but I also know that I need to. So when you take those moments to actually do it, you've kind of got that sense of validation, I suppose, because you realize it's a really healthy thing for your personality type to do. And I know there's always, there's the, the things that I also picked up on in reading some of the book is that basically emotional, emotion driven personality types and thought driven or analytical driven personality types, they're going to seem to be the ones that really grate against each other the most because the emotional person will feel like, why don't you see how much this affects me or how much I feel this? And then the thought person will be like, but why can't you just walk through this and see that we have an outcome we need to get to, you know, and in the application of work and life, it's going to be so different for everyone. It really is. And I think that's actually a really good point. We live, um, I don't know if we have time for this, but if we do, we have um, what we call triads as well. So as you mentioned, we have the thinking, the feeling, and the gut triads. Um, what you have inside of the Enneagram as well, this could be a little bit confusing if you're just listening to it, but we have what we call stress and security numbers. So for example, the type nine will go to the three and will go to the six in stress and security. Now these don't necessarily... Um, they don't necessarily mean that you're stressed when you go to them. I like to think of them as growth numbers. You go to them both in growth and you learn from them and you work with them. Um, but that just kind of gives you another layer to the Enneagram and there's more beyond that as well. But the nice thing is that most of these types connect to another number that's in a thinking or a feeling or a gut triad that's not necessarily their primary number. So you do have access to those. It's just a matter mm -hmm. of learning. How do I put myself in the thinking triad? So for example, I go to the thinking triad when I'm stressed and I go to the feelings triad when I'm secure. Um, so it's more of a matter of, okay, if I'm in a thinking stance right now, why am I in a thinking stance? Um, how did I get here? What can I learn from this? And mm. so likewise for the feelings triad, they have the opportunity to go to the thinking triad. They have the opportunity to go to the gut triad. And how do you layer that? And how do you think about how do you how do you articulate and think, okay, why am I here? And I think that really, really helps when you're thinking about it from a mental standpoint as well. And I like looking at this whole thing as well as something that also helps us create community. This isn't just about individualism and about, you know, this is my number and make room for me because this is my number. But it's interesting when, and I think if anyone has not done the Enneagram test before and worked out what you are and then done it to some of your friends, you realize actually once you work out which types go well together and which can be healthy as a group, mm. interestingly, a lot of our friends are already those types. Like I found this for me that yeah. it's the people that I naturally gravitated to and if you look at it through the idea that, you know, God really does place us in families and God does bring about the communities that we're placed in. He does put us with people that help one another that, you know, we are the best support for somebody else in our life. They can be the best support for us. Absolutely. We have relationships that cause us tension within these mixes as well, but it's like, even if you don't understand this through the idea of the Enneagram, it is also at play in your life in some respect. Absolutely. And I think it's even just taking on board the idea of conflict in relationship, um, because that can be such a game changer and such a deal breaker, depending on how you take control of it. Um, so again, it's not just give me my seat at the table because I'm entitled to it. It's a lot of people tend to be conflict avoidant because of the love is easy message that we kind of grew up with. Um, thanks, Disney. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The reality is you don't really know how much you love that person in your life until you've had a conflict with them. Um, and I think, as you said, I've learned that firsthand and you have no idea how another person deals with anger, with stress. And when, you know, you can actually make a thoroughly educated 
guests on the longevity of your relationship with them. And like the hope is that when you have those specific friendships, they, they go a long way. And in your community, they go a long way. Um, but I think ultimately communication is key. And mm. knowing the identifying traits of stress at the beginning is a huge aspect because you're able to say, hey, look, I know a lot is going on for you. How can I help? And that builds community a lot more quickly than just being there for the for the good stuff. Mm. Um, and when we become better, the relationships around us become better. And vulnerability is a huge aspect of that. Absolutely. I mean, so many wise people say you've got to be healthy as an individual before you can be healthy as a couple or to, even if it's not romantically related. You know, healthy individuals make healthy relationships in all contexts. Yes. So I feel like this is going to be, a, you know, a huge place to start for people. But Sierra, I want to ask you for people right now listening, the Enneagram may be something they're familiar with, not familiar with. It has been around for a number of years now since its, it's, uh, its founders originally started talking about it. In the context of our world right now, mm -hmm. in the challenges people are facing in a day-to-day -day space right now, what do you think the relevance is of something like the Enneagram to help us get to a place of health? Oh, that's a really good question. I think when we look at where we are here and now, um, the big thing is always keeping vision in mind as well as being present focused. And I've heard it so many times, you can have a vision, but unless you're making those steps day by day, you're just never going to get there. It's the how do you get from point A to point B um, and actually making daily steps to get there. And so I think where we are in a world right now where things maybe are a lot more shaken up and we just got out of a pandemic. It feels like we just got out of the pandemic and, and we're still going to, we're going to keep seeing the repercussions of that for years. I think making sure that knowing your, your own vulnerable spots um, is actually a really helpful tool. Um, I think Brene Brown says something along the lines of vulnerability sounds like truth and feels like courage. And then truth and courage aren't always comfortable, but they're never weaknesses. Um, so I think walking in the spirit of truth, even if you, even if you never take the Enneagram test, walking in the spirit of truth, not necessarily your own truth, because your own truth is going to be different. And that's a whole other tangent, <laughs> but walking in a spirit of truth, um, and, and revealing that truth about yourself, but also about other people is something that's really going to contribute to where we go as a future. And I think, um, this generation that we have right now coming through, they're very concerned with authenticity. They're very concerned with truth, um, yeah. We've and they're also it. really, no, they're really open to therapy as well. seems to be. They're really open to <laughs> and hopefully, hopefully that's going to help a lot of people. I mean, you know, I it, think it, that's it, one of the best things that has come through. Like we're so open to, we're so open to rewiring the software and the hardware of our brains. Mm. And that's wonderful. I think that's positively incredible. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, Sierra, thank you so much for taking time to dive into the Enneagram a little bit more with us today. And also in your book, it is called The Complete Guide to the Enneagram, A Modern Approach to Self-Discovery and Connecting Well with Others. Sierra, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me again. It was lovely talking to you. 